Welcome back to the Code Long series on creating a chat application. Continuing from where we left off last time, let's have a look at how we are storing user credentials in our database so far. Just like username, we have been storing our password in our database as plain text, that is, without any encryption. This is not a good practice. Our customers can often reuse the same password across multiple websites, so we need to take care that our customers' plain text passwords are not stored in the database. So even if an unauthorized user agent gets access to the database, the user's password should not be compromised. So the simplest approach is to use a hashing function and then store only the value in the database. So problem solved? Not quite. This approach still leaves us vulnerable to several different types of attacks. Someone could create a dictionary of the most likely passwords or passphrases and try each one out at a time till they guess the password of a user. Or alternatively, the attacker can brute force their way in by trying every single combination of keys till they come up with the right password. The other flaw is at the other end of the diagram, our database. If an unauthorized user gets access to our database or a backup copy of it, they could use a pre-computed table for the hashing algorithm we are using. These pre-computed tables are called rainbow tables and they can be used to work backwards to figure out what our users' passwords are. Now, one way in which we can add a layer of protection against these attacks is to introduce a random string while hashing. This random string is called as the salt. The salt can be added to the password or it can be passed directly to the hashing function. Either ways, since we are adding a random string for each new password that is hashed, so the end result is that even if there are two identical passwords, the output hash will be different. So this means a dictionary attack is no longer going to be all that effective because the attacker now would have to try different salts for every single password that they want. Now the other advantage of this approach is that because a random salt is used for every new password, the size of the rainbow hash table would have to be of magnitudes more massive to pull off a successful attack. This makes rainbow table attacks much more difficult. However, even when we use a salt, we are still vulnerable to brute force attacks where someone can try out every single key combination till they hit upon the correct one. So to add another layer of security, we can also define how many times will the hashing function run. Or to put it another way, how many iterations will it have? Adding more iterations makes the hashing function slower. So the question is, why in the world would we want to intentionally slow down our function? Well, a slower function is more immune to brute force attacks since it will take longer to test out each possible key combination. So this makes brute force attacks much slower and therefore so much more difficult to pull off successfully. So when it comes to password hashing, slower is strangely enough better. In cryptography, a key derivation function essentially takes an input, such as a password, and uses a pseudo-random function to generate an output. Now, there are a lot of hashing algorithms that can be used. I've just listed down three of the more popular ones. Obviously, these are not the only ones, but these could be the ones that you encounter more often than others. For our project, we'll use PBKDF2. It stands for Password Based Key Derivation Function, version 2. If you want to see videos of other hash functions, let me know in the comments below and we could do a separate video for each one. All right, so let's go to the terminal. We are in the folder that we created last time for creating the chat application and we have activated the virtual environment. There are different modules for PBKDF2. We are going to be using the one that comes with Passlib. So what is Passlib? It is a password hashing library for Python and it comes with 30 different types of hashing algorithms that we can choose from. So even bcrypt in Argon2 can be imported from Passlib library. Before we can start using Passlib, we need to install it. And as we have done with previous modules, we will use pip. The syntax is pip install Passlib. Passlib has been installed successfully. Now let's go to our program and see how we use this library. This is the application.py file that we have been working on in the last couple of videos. 
Don't worry if you are watching this video in isolation. The process for using the hashing function is not going to be dramatically different for your project. To start with, let's import pbkdf2 module from parslib library. When we do this, we need to specify which cryptographic hash will we be using. We will be using SHA-256. We could have also used SHA-512 and the syntax would have been identical for both of them. Now let's scroll down to the section where we will be using this function. This is where we capture the input that the user typed into the form. This password right here is in plain text and this syntax for capturing the value from the form is flask WTF syntax. Now specifics of this syntax is not important for this video. If you are interested, you can click on the link above to watch the video where I explain this. To generate a hash from this plain text password, the syntax is pbkdf2 underscore the digest used sha256 dot hash and then type in the plain text password, which is password. So this password value is the one right here. Here's a question. Remember when we were talking about key derivation functions, we said that we can specify both a salt and the number of iterations? We don't seem to have done either of them in the syntax. So what's going on? Well, this module automatically takes care of both the salt and the number of iterations. By default, it will automatically add a 16-byte salt. We don't have to specify this. And it will also add 29,000 iterations by default. Now, for whatever reason, in case we wish to modify either one of them, the syntax would be dot using specify iterations, let's say 1000, and the length of the salt in bytes, let's say 8 bytes. We don't have any reason to modify this, so we will stick to the default. I will leave a link in the description below to the Passlib documentation page in case you want to explore this further. So let's store the output of this function in a variable called hashed password. That's it. That's the hash of the password. We can now store this value directly into the database. In this particular example, we will use Flask SQL Alchemy syntax that we worked with earlier. And you can watch that video by clicking on the link above. Let's edit this. So instead of storing this plain text password, let's replace it with this hashed password. Okay. So let's see this in action. Let's start the server. Let's copy this URL and paste it. This is the registration page that we created in the previous video. Let's register a user called user5 and the password is test. We are seeing the login page. We have successfully registered the user. Let's go back to the registration page one more time. Remember how I said earlier that every time you hash a password, the hashed value will be different because of the salt? We should also test that here. Let's register another user, say user 6. We will give this user the exact same password as user 5, which was test. Perfect. To verify that the password is now stored as a hashed value, we need to connect to the database. I already have a terminal window that's open, which is in the folder that we created in the first video and also with the virtual environment activated. The syntax to connect to the database that we saw last time was psql, followed by the link to the database, which we can copy from here and paste it here. Perfect. We are connected to the database. So there is the user's table. Now to see the entries within the table, the syntax that we saw earlier was table users. So these are all the users that stored in the database. There are six of them right now. The first four of them, user one, two, three, and four, the password is stored in plain text. User five and user six that we stored right now, the password is stored as a hashed value. Let's take a closer look at what this is. This is in a format called as modular crypt format. It's a standard that defines the format of the output. Dollar signs are used as section breaks. It starts with an identifier showing the hashing algorithm that's used. In our case, it's pbkdf2 and we used SHA-256. And then the parameters used. 
in this case it's the number of iterations if you recollect 29000 is the default number of iterations used in pbktf2 what this means is that this function ran 29000 times after the iteration you have the 16 bit salt which was used and this salt will be different for every password that's saved so we saved user 5 and user 6 using the exact same password this is the salt which was used for user 5 a completely different salt was used for user 6 because the salts are different the hash is also completely different for two identical passwords Okay, so we are able to hash the password and we are able to store the hashed value in the database. The next step is to verify whether the user has entered the correct password. So let's see how password verification would work. If you recollect, we had written the code for login validation in another file just to keep our main application program clean. In case you want to know more about this and you're watching this as a standalone video, you can always click on the link above. So we need to import the module. Since the contents of this entire file is being imported into our main application, we don't need to import it twice. We can cut the module from here and paste it directly here. So this is where we are checking whether the user credentials are valid. And this is where we are checking whether the password entered by the user matches the password which is stored in the database. This is the code that we wrote in the previous video. That's part seven of this video series and you will find the link in the description below. And we can get rid of this entire code. Here's a question. Why can't I hash the password entered by the user? So why can't I take this value entered by the user, hash it and just compare it to the hashed value stored in the database? That's right. Remember, each time we run the hash function, it will generate a unique salt, which means that even if we hash two identical passwords, the resulting hash will be different. So we'll not be able to hash the password entered by the user and compare that value to the database, because even if the user entered the right password, the hashed value is going to be different. So if the output is different even for two identical passwords, how can we compare the hash values? pbkdf2 module comes with a verification method, which is pbkdf2 underscore sha256 dot verify. The first parameter is the plain text password followed by the hash you want to compare it to. The plain text password here is the one entered by the user attempting to log in and it's called password entered. and we want to compare this plain text password to the hash. If you guys have seen the previous video on Flash SQL Alchemy, you know we can retrieve the data of the password column by user underscore object dot name of the column, which is password. So the hash password in the database is stored in a column called as password. So if the hash of the plain text password matches this hashed value in our database, this will return true. Otherwise, it will return false. So this is just a way for us to check whether this function does return false. And if it does return false, it raises a validation error. Let's go test this in our browser. I'll save this file. I will also save this file. Going back to the browser. So we are already in the login page. We will log in user 5 and the password was test. So we can see the login confirmation that we had written in application.py. Let's try this again, but this time with an incorrect password. So instead of test, I will say 1234. It throws the username or password as incorrect error. So this entire program is working as expected. Before we end this, let's commit the changes that we have made. Let me stop the server. Get status. We have modified two files. Let's commit the changes. So that's it for this video. In the next video, we'll talk about session management and we will use an extension called Flask login for this. If you found this video helpful, please hit the like button, share it with your friends and subscribe to the channel. See you in the next video.